Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India topic for discussion today is heme containing compounds. So, the objective of my class will be to study the heme various heme containing compounds and the structure of heme, application of structural and genetic knowledge of normal hemoglobin. So, let us first see what is there in our nature. The sunlight, the sun energy which is uh, ubiquitous present in plenty how beautifully that a plant kingdom utilizes this sun energy and they use carbon dioxide and they release oxygen which is useful for human beings. In this bargain they generate two things, one is they release oxygen which is vital for the life of all living beings in the earth. At the same time they generate a wonderful molecule called as sugar or carbohydrate by just joining together carbon dioxide which is a gas which is exhaled from our body which is a waste material with the plain water with the using the light energy of the sun to form a molecule called a carbohydrate which is the predominant uh, source of energy. You may be wondering why I am telling this in the class of hemoglobin. You see in this next slide who is doing this entire work? A molecule called as chlorophyll which is there in a, uh, plants which is able to generate this energy rich molecule called carbohydrate using the energy from the sunlight. Whereas, on the left hand side you see a structure almost homologous to it which is called as hemoglobin which does exactly the opposite. That means, it can use sugar molecule, but there is no need to have a sunlight which using the enzyme system in the body, it causes CO2 and water and it generates lot of energy for us. So, it is very, very interesting to know both these opposite reactions are done by almost homologous compound you can closely look at it. The structure of both has a tetrapyrrol ring and the only important difference is in the case of chlorophyll, we have magnesium atom at the center whereas, in case of hemoglobin, we have iron atom in the center. So, let us see how this hemoglobin, one more important function of the hemoglobin is to transport oxygen oxygen is very much vital to generate energy from the glucose molecule or any other nutrients in all the cells of our body under aerobic conditions. So, as you can see the oxygen dissociation curve, if you can see the y axis has the percentage of oxygen saturation, the x axis has the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood or in the lungs. So, as you can see in the peripheral tissue, uh, as the blood flows from the lungs to peripheral tissue, all the cells in the body start using up this oxygen to generate energy in the mitochondria. So, as it reaches the distant organs, the oxygen available in the blood will be very less, it may be less than 40 percent. In spite of that, hemoglobin is able to release oxygen. That means, the half saturation, the P50 we call it is as low as less than 40 percent of saturation. That means, it is not a straight line curve as we expect. As the oxygen uh, concentration uh, increases, the percentage of saturation it does not increase in the straight line. That means, something better than the straight line. How this is possible? How then a protein molecule can take up more oxygen even at a lesser concentration. 
this is very important to understand from the structural point of view. Let us try to understand, this is a typical structure of an adult hemoglobin. You can see it has uh, two alpha chains and two beta chains and the center of which is the heme atom where the each heme atom can take up one oxygen molecule. That means, at oxygenated hemoglobin can take up to four molecules of oxygen in an oxygenated state. So, how this can take up an oxygen faster than expected? So, as you can see this is a typical uh, conformational change that occurs in a typical hemoglobin whenever it comes in across the oxygen. So, this is a uh, diagrammatic representation, you can see the four squares are here. This may be uh, alpha chains alpha 1, alpha 2, beta 1, beta 2. In a deoxygenated state, it is called as taut or tense state, it is very tightly opposed to each other. But whenever an, it reaches an oxygen rich environment, there occurs a conformational change, it opens up for oxygen and that is called as the relaxed state or R state. When it opens up, when the first one of the uh, chains, maybe alpha chain binds to the oxygen, it further increases the affinity for the next chain, so that it can bind the next molecule of oxygen at more ease and further it increases for the third molecule and hence likewise. This is called as cooperative effect. That means, it uh, somehow facilitates faster binding, binding of oxygen to one of the units, one of the chains facilitates further binding of oxygen to remaining uh, uh, chains of hemoglobin. So, same thing is uh, depicted here. As you can see in uh, R state, when the deoxygenated state that a taut hemoglobin tight state or called tense state, hemoglobin get exposed to the oxygen molecule, it opens up and starts binding to the oxygen. When one of the chain gets bound to the oxygen, it further facilitates binding of further atoms of oxygen and completely become oxygenated and that is called an R state or relaxed state. So, likewise this cycle will continue. This is made possible because of the conformational chain that is the movement between alpha and beta chains so as to facilitate further binding of oxygen. So, now let us see one more diagram. Here again same thing x axis has a partial pressure of oxygen, y axis has the percentage of saturation. You can see the unique difference that is a fetal hemoglobin here. This is a typical red curve shows a typical oxygen dissociation curve of an adult hemoglobin, whereas the fetal hemoglobin is even more efficient. You may be wondering why it is so. The very reason being uh, the fetus is inside the maternal womb, mother has to use the oxygen for her own needs and whatever the leftover oxygen reaches the placental bed, from there the fetal hemoglobin should able to absorb whatever the remaining oxygen for its survival. So, unless there is a higher affinity for the fetal hemoglobin than the adult hemoglobin, probably the oxygen transport will not occur effectively. So, this is a beautiful design of the nature, how it is possible? That means, the chains which are present in a fetal hemoglobin, unlike a adult hemoglobin, there is a small difference. The, even though the alpha chain remains the same, in place of the beta chain, we have two different chains called as gamma chain. So, adult has alpha 2 and beta 2, two alpha chains and two beta chains, whereas the fetal hemoglobin has two alpha chains and two gamma chains. So, just because of this change, it is able to bind oxygen more efficiently than that of adult hemoglobin for a purpose. Let us see one more important molecule which is present in all of us. I hope you recognize this. This is a 
typical structure of myoglobin. So, the heme per se remains the same, there is no much difference like a adult hemoglobin, only difference being there is no four chains, only one category alpha chains are there in myoglobin. So, what it uh, in what matter it uh, matters to us, the knowledge of uh, this is different from both fetal as well as that of adult hemoglobin, how it is different. Just because it does not have the liberty of having four chains, how it is going to affect its function? Let us see that. You can see the oxygen dissociation curve here. Again, the x axis contains the uh, uh, amount of oxygen pressure in the, uh, in the blood and uh, y axis contains the saturation, at what saturation it is present. As you can typically see here, we already discussed that fetal hemoglobin has more affinity to bind oxygen as compared to the adult hemoglobin and we have already learned that for the reason. Whereas, myoglobin even though it does not has a gamma chain like that of fetal hemoglobin, still it has a very high affinity to bind oxygen. In spite of uh, that is because it does not have uh, more than one chain, it has only one type category of them, there is no cooperative binding, it is just one time bonding. The, the very reason being muscle tissue is one of the area which carries your weight around and it demands a lot of energy, it has to generate its own energy. So, but it has to take the oxygen from the peripheral blood after it is whatever is left over after it is utilized by the peripheral cells. So, unless it is a very efficiently able to take up that remaining oxygen for its purpose, probably it may not be able to utilize this oxygen for its own purpose effectively. Just because of the non-availability of more than one change in myoglobin has beautifully facilitated its function by the virtue of this curve you can see it is able to take up oxygen even more efficiently than that of adult and fetal hemoglobin. Now, let us see uh, an effect of external factors on this oxygen dissociation curve. Again this graph shows x axis has the partial pressure of oxygen and the y axis has the saturation of oxygen. You can see whenever there is a fall in blood pH that is whenever there is an acidosis is there and one more there is one more uh, molecule called as 2,3-bisphosphoglycerate which is a intermediate formed in a pathway called as glycolysis in all cells of the body including RBC and whenever there is an increased temperature of the body. So, what happens here is especially the 2,3-BPG is one of the intermediate formed during glycolysis. It has the ability to interact with an adult hemoglobin and facilitates release of oxygen from the hemoglobin to the tissue. That means, it can shift the oxygen dissociation curve to the right. You can see if it is a, there is a whenever there is increase the bisphosphoglycerate is there, it can shift the oxygen dissociation curve to the right. So, this uh, knowledge it will help us to understand whenever there is an hypoxia, especially the patient is on a higher altitude and he has to take up oxygen whenever there is a less oxygen saturation there in the air, his uh, 2, 3 BPG level automatically rises. It is an, uh, a mechanism of nature to save life uh, so that with the available of oxygen, whatever limited oxygen, it can still uh, release more oxygen to the tissue wherever it is required. Similarly, in case of pregnant woman, the pregnant woman has to release oxygen after her use to the baby inside the womb. So, automatically a natural phenomena, the 2-3 BPG level in her blood rises by around 20 to 30 percent during pregnancy 
just to help to facilitate more release of oxygen to the fetus across the placental bed. So, this uh, external factors beautifully make sure that uh, there is a release of oxygen to the tissues is not at all compromised. So, whenever there is a problem of uh, either the genetic problem in uh, there is a 2, 3 BPG is not formed and whenever there is a fall in temperature or whenever there is alkalosis, the oxygen dissociation curve turns to the left. So, now let us see the what may be the effect of these external factors on these three hemoglobins. It is very surprising to know that fetal hemoglobin will not interact with the 2, 3 BPG molecule at all just because it does not have the beta chains. Instead, it has a gamma chains. There is a very unique reason for this. The reason being even though mother is eager to release more oxygen by using 2, 3 BPG from her blood across the placental bed to the fetus, fetus should not leak it back if in case the fetal hemoglobin was able to interact with the 2, 3 BPG in a similar re reciprocal way, there may be a chance that whatever oxygen taken up from the fetal hemoglobin might have leaked back into the maternal circulation. So, to just to safeguard against this, the nature has designed such a way that fetal hemoglobin or myoglobin will not interact with the 2, 3 BPG. Now, let us see about the genetic component of these hemoglobin molecules during the birth. The initial embryonic life in place of beta chain, we have uh, the beta chain comes from chromosome number 11 and alpha chain clusters are present in chromosome number 16. So, the beta chain in a early embryonic life has epsilon and uh, late part of the pregnancy we have uh, gamma chains and uh, in adults we have beta and small amount of predominantly beta and small component of delta chains. Similarly, in for in place of alpha chains, we have two zeta chains in embryonic life which will be effectively replaced by alpha chains. This is a diagram of one strand of the chromosome. That means, in any given time, adults will have two genes for beta two genes for delta 1 on each chromosome, similarly two on each chromosome of alpha chains. That means, we have four genes for alpha and two genes for beta in adults. So, that is that's the reason probably because of a more than nearly four genes are there for alpha, alpha gene related diseases are relatively rare as compared to that of beta chain related disorders. Let us see how these different uh, genes during the embryonic life are produced. As you can see at the embryonic we have the zeta and uh, epsilon chains which are relatively stop functioning even though at birth the initial first uh, few days of life by 6 or 8 weeks they stop their functioning and the alpha chain starts itself and reaches the peak even by 6 weeks and then, then onwards throughout the adult life alpha chain remains the same. So, even in fetal hemoglobin or HBF alpha chain is very much there like that of adult. The only difference being that of the gamma chain. As you can see here, up to a near birth, the predominant uh, chain other than alpha is the gamma chain. So, the HBF is a predominant hemoglobin in fetal life. Within 6 to 12 weeks of the birth, 
all the gamma chains will be replaced by the beta chains. So, there is a rapid uh, change over from gamma to beta chains in adults. So, this is because beta chain has a unique ability to interact with 2, 3 BPG whereas, the gamma chain does not and this is called as gene switching mechanism. So, uh, and a small component maybe 1 or 2 percent delta chains may be there. So, this uh, uh, this component what happens is whenever there is a problem in adults of the beta chain for example, in case of beta thalassemia wherein the production of beta chain is not occurring effectively because of some genetic defect in adults sometimes gamma chain production increases rapidly. So, the person with the thalassemia beta thalassemia sometimes there will be reactivation of gamma chains in adults and he will be having predominantly in addition to adult hemoglobin HBF also in his blood. This is a protective mechanism. So, let us now compare some unique different categories of hemoglobin other than what we learned just now. So far we have learned that is hemoglobin, we learned about myoglobin and we learned about HBF, HBA and three categories. Now, let us see one more category of hemoglobin which is present in all of us that are called cytochrome. Cytochromes are enzymes which are present in uh, our mitochondria and microsomes and they will help us in uh, generation of energy in electron transport chain as well as detoxification of various xenobiotics. There is a very unique structural difference even though both are heme compounds you can see the right hand side is typical hemoglobin of heme, 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 typical heme of adult hemoglobin whereas, this heme A is uh, that is a heme present in the cytochromes. What is the important difference? You can see here uh, in the heme of the hemoglobin we have a uh, position 8 we have one methyl group this has been oxidized to a formyl group in the heme A which is present in cytochrome and one more important difference here is we have a vinyl group as position 2 which has been replaced by an isoprenoid chain in case of heme present in cytochromes. So, just because of this minor difference in this structure is a functional capacity is totally different. The only difference here you can see here unlike a typical heme which in which the iron always remains in a ferrous state in case of cytochromes it can keep changing from ferric to ferrous state for during its function. So, this is a unique difference of the mechanism of heme action in cytochrome versus and hemoglobin. In hemoglobin iron always remains in ferrous state. So, just to summarize what are the different other heme containing compounds? We have already learned about hemoglobin, we learned about myoglobin that is present in the muscle and in under hemoglobin again we learned about adult and fetal hemoglobin, then we learned about cytochromes. There are some more heme containing compounds which act like an enzymes. They are basically catalase, glutathione peroxidase and tryptophan pyrolase. Out of the three, the catalase and glutathione peroxidase are important antioxidant enzymes present in our system they effectively neutralize the free radical 
and the possible damage to our health. So, how they can do? The catalase you can see hydrogen peroxide is a typical free radical. It will use the iron and it uh, effectively neutralizes it to water by series of reactions. You can see here the iron in the process keep changing from uh, the three uh, uh, Fe uh, that valency changes it can accept or release an electron in the bargain the hydrogen peroxide is neutralized to a harmless water. Similarly, glutathione peroxidase also has a heme wherein it neutralizes hydrogen peroxide to water. The next important enzyme that is tryptophan pyrolase which is a uh, required for tryptophan metabolism in the process it converts tryptophan to N formyl kynurenine. It, uh, it is a dioxygenase wherein it uh, is able to incorporate the two atoms of oxygen into the tryptophan to form N formyl kynurenine. So, I hope today you have understood whatever I discussed today that is the structural importance of various hemoglobin, their key differences, the mechanism of action of heme compounds, their oxygen dissociation curve and the, the action of 2, 3 BPG on hemoglobin and action of pH and other external factors on oxygen dissociation curve. Thank you for your attention.